Are hunger and obesity two sides of the same coin? Research shows that hunger and obesity often occur in the same populations, sometimes even in the same families. Both epidemics are often a consequence of a lack of access to enough nutritious food, a direct result of poverty. Today, there are nearly a billion people living with hunger worldwide and just over a billion people living with obesity. So, is there a link? Joining me now with an answer to that question is Ellen Gustafson. She's the founder of the 30 Project, a campaign that has helped identify the connection between hunger and obesity and to change the discussion about the global food system. Her new book, We the Eaters, also examines hunger and obesity as different manifestations of the same problem, a problem that she says can be solved by what we choose to put on the dinner table. We want to welcome you to Full Frame. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. These are staggering numbers, one billion, one billion. And most people lump this one billion here, this one billion here, and you're like, no. Um, what made you think <laughs> no? Because a lot of people don't think no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the numbers are really staggering. Actually, just recently, new research came out that the number of, of the global overweight is, is now nearing 2 billion people. So Jeez. we're talking about a huge population of the earth that's dealing with some sort of food-related malnutrition issue. And the, the awakening for me actually happened um, in Africa, which is an area that we think of, you know, coming from America, we think of as, as a region of, of, of just hunger. Actually, in Africa, there exists both hunger and obesity. And in the urban areas where people eat a more Western diet, there tends to be higher levels of obesity. And then in the rural areas or some urban poorer communities where people don't have access to a lot of food, there's still, of course, chronic hunger. I was in one of those hungry regions in Uganda in 2009 and went into a store, a grocery store, just trying to get food for myself and noticed it was a lot of processed junk food and soda and chips and sweets. And I, I had this kind of feeling of like, wow, here I am in an area I thought would just have very little food, but there's tons of junk. And then honestly, getting back on a plane and coming back to the US and landing in an airport, JFK airport in America, I, I, I had such a similar food experience in one of those little airport shops. Like the same food options were available to me. And it was really that aha moment of like, huh, here in America, we're struggling because of these limited food options. We have a raging obesity problem in, in you know, in the rural community in Africa I was in because of these limited food options, they have a, a really big hunger problem. Maybe there's something there and maybe they're really very connected problems. And you know, you're a person who grew up here in the United States and probably sees all the, the great things about this country. And I imagine you, at some point, you probably start scratching your head and saying, geez, this is going to be the one thing we export, obesity? Because in, in many respects, it's, you look at some of these countries, and, and there are a lot of them where people had a, a diet that they were on, they're doing fine, suddenly all this stuff arrives. And now, I mean, you talk about Guatemala. When I think of Guatemala or, or Mexico even, you know, when I was growing up, you go down there, the food was great, you know, it's traditional, but now you have obesity there as well. Absolutely, and you know, when you look at the, our neighbors to the south, Guatemala is a fascinating example. It has the fourth highest rate of malnutrition in the world, the highest in, on, on the, in our hemisphere but also it has the highest rate of obesity in Central America. Of course, Mexico has one of the highest rates of obesity in the world. So we're talking about regions right near us who are adopting our food culture, but not necessarily adopting the success we've had you know, with, with all elements of food, still having chronic long-term malnutrition and hunger and now being being you know more and more eating more and more like Americans having a raging obesity problem too. Well I think in, in one of the points I think you make in your book is that you can go into a home in Guatemala and find both obesity and hunger. Absolutely you can actually you know even here in America Mississippi is a state that has one of the highest levels of hunger and the highest levels of obesity here in America and often it exists in the same person which people, I think, find very strange. But when you, when you look at, at a lot of the uh, you know, Americans that are using food banks, there's 49 million hungry Americans. And sometimes when they present themselves at a food bank, you might look, think, look at them and think, no, they're, they're overweight. But that same person could actually be overweight and have eaten too many calories, but be malnourished and not have eaten the right nutrients. And that's a subtlety of the modern Western diet that really has almost never been seen before. You gave this TED talk, you got a standing ovation. Congratulations Thanks. for that, because there's been a lot of great TED talks. Um, and did you have people come up to you afterwards and say, 
because you said you had your aha moment. Did they come up and say, wow, you know, I mean, they must have, you know, people must have said, I never thought of it like that. Absolutely. You know, what was cool is I gave my first uh, TEDx talk in 2010, and it was one of the first times that I had seen you know, anyone really make this deep connection between hunger and obesity, things that are happening overseas and things that are happening here at home. And a lot of people, I think, realized had traveled, had seen these things. You know, Americans are, are more and more interested in, in, in what's going on around the world. And so many people were like, wow, that's so true. And I also have found that in the food space itself, among activists, among people that are working on hunger or working on sustainable food, there's since then been more and more of an awareness to the fact that our issues here at home are incredibly linked to what's going on around the world, and we can't separate them. We have to really view them as one big global food system. Well, let's talk about that linkage, too, because you don't think of this other link that you, you talk about, which is national security. And interestingly enough, I was in Somalia back in the early 90s, and I, and I saw famine firsthand. And yet, when you look at one of the areas that seems like that there's a resurgence of, of terrorist activity, it's Somalia. And you say that there is a linkage between these sorts of things. Absolutely. It's, it's actually how I got into food in the first place. I mean, I love to eat, don't we all? But, but, but really, my career was started working on terrorism issues. I, I was in school in New York when 9-11 happened, was very interested in, you know, how this all came to be, this whole problem of terrorism. And, and I was working on security issues and noticed, wow, the map of the world where there are big security problems looks a lot like the map of the world where there's chronic hunger. And of course, when you really compare them, the Horn of Africa where Somalia is, and even some of the areas in you know, the Afghanistan, Pakistan region, the, 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 the Andes mountain region you know, to, in, in South America, a lot of regions that have had chronic long-term violence have also had chronic long-term hunger. And there's like a, a great African proverb, you know, a hungry man is an angry man. And it, honestly, it's really true. When people don't have their fundamental food security, their kids are hungry, their neighbors are hungry, maybe violence can seem like a decent answer. So policy decisions, do you think that they need to shift? I mean, in terms of like maybe not so much money towards drones, maybe a little bit more money spent on trying to address this issue? Well, something I think has gone a little bit wrong with our food aid policy, especially in the last 30 years, which is very connected to what's gone wrong in our domestic food policies, is that we've shifted from trying to help farmers and people in, in the developing world grow more of their own food towards sending more of our food overseas. So we've got this great excess of corn and soybeans. Let's just send it over and, and help feed the hungry. And of course, in the short term, that's a great idea, because when you're talking about people that are hungry today, let's find a way to feed them. But now that we've seen the long term of those policies, we haven't developed the sustainable solutions for people in the developing world to feed themselves. And so relying on American food aid isn't really a long-term solution to ending hunger. Okay, so one of the things that you like to do is get out and advocate and to talk about this passionately. But you've done some other things. And, and one of the things that I find fascinating is the feed bags and how all of that came about. And just how <laughs> you don't really think of a bag having that much of an impact, but it's had a dramatic impact, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also taught me a great lesson. I mean, co-founding a company that was selling a, a, a consumer product, a, a tote bag, a series of, of different products that help feed the hungry, taught me how powerful the American or the Western consumer can be. You know, people initially thought, oh, this is such this, this silly little project, you know, these, these girls starting a, a, a small handbag company. And we've been able to provide through Feed's work, you know, while I was there and, and even since I've left, over 60 million school meals for children around the world. And that, that's an impact that's directly related to American consumers wanting to help people places far away from themselves do something for themselves. And I think that's what I'm hoping that people can bring back to their kitchen table. The idea that if we bring that same intention that, that we're so interested in using our capitalist consumer dollars for something good, if we actually bring that to the grocery store with us, we'll help ourselves be healthier and we'll also really be able to help the world. You, you say, uh, you, you talk about the tote bags, but when you first came up with the idea, you wanted to go a traditional avenue and that went nowhere. I mean, weren't you going to the United Nations and say, I got this great idea, but that again kind of gets into that whole kind of, that's part of the problem is these bureaucracies are slow in moving too, right? Well, it's so amazing to, to have had the entrepreneurial experience because you really see that the solutions to the biggest problems are going to come from entrepreneurs. And so, you know, with the example of Feed, when we first came up with the idea for, you know, selling, pro selling this bag, 
we thought, okay, the UN World Food Program will sell this bag and it will help raise money. But of course, the UN World Food Program is not equipped to sell a consumer product. That's not what their job is, right? Their job is to feed people. So we realized, actually, we'll have to create a separate business. We'll have to go outside of the UN and create a company. And when we did, we saw the incredible success. We were part of a very early movement of social entrepreneurship, of other people creating these businesses that were meant to solve a social problem. And of course, since then, we've seen an explosion of businesses that do very similar things. Use the consumer's for-profit dollar to help do something to improve the world. And it's amazing how entrepreneurs, whether they're social entrepreneurs creating a, a company like Feed, or people that are creating small food business, or even farmers who are also entrepreneurs, are really where the solutions to our food systems problems totally lie. Because I argue that some of the biggest, most entrenched companies aren't going to be where the biggest solutions come from. Um, so a consumer watching this in their home, uh, rather than just put away the, the cola mm -hmm. and the junk food, uh, what steps would you advocate that they take? Because I, you point out you're, you're one person uh, and you come up with this idea, it has a huge impact. I, so uh, one person can make a difference. What would you suggest to consumers watching this? Well, I think what's neat and, and, and amazing about food is that the solutions that are best for your health also happen to be the solutions that are best for the world. So a great example of this is sugar. You know, sugar is a product that often comes from large plantation farms in the global south, in areas where people are working for very little money. It's also a product that we shouldn't be eating so much of. So the idea is if we're buying better quality sugar that's maybe you know made on fair trade farms where people are paid better and it's more expensive to us as, as, as the end consumer, that you know, price makes it so that we don't want to eat as much sugar. And oh, by the way, not eating as much sugar is, of course, better for us. Eating more local fresh fruits and vegetables, supporting local farmers or entrepreneurs that are coming up with healthy products right near our house is, of course, better for the local community. It's better for our local economy. It's better for those farmers. It's also better for our health. And, you know, a, another great example of this is meat. Like, I, as, as a meat eater myself, of course, we, we as Americans love to eat our hamburgers, but if we make our hamburgers from really good quality grass-fed meat, where the environment is more you know, well-considered, where the animals are more well-considered, where the farmer is paid a fair price and not just in this system of high conglomerates that you know, don't really pay the farmers that well and, of course, then charge us, the argument is if you buy that better quality meat, if it is more expensive, you'll eat less of it. And most Americans could probably eat a little bit less meat. Right. So, so it's really this argument that the things that are better for the planet, for the world, are also better for our health. So let's just align these things when we go to the grocery store and think longer term and think about how our impact is not just on our body, but literally on the world. Thank you so much for coming in. It's been a delight. Thank really you very much. It. Coming up, this week's close-up on an artist whose decision to step in and offer help in the aftermath of an earthquake is still having an impact today.